The Unteachables by Gordon Corman. Chapter 1. Kiana Robini. It's no fun riding to school with Step Monster. Not with Chauncey screaming his lungs in the back seat. Don't get me wrong. I'd cry too if I just figured out that Step Monster is my mother. But at seven months old, I don't think he's processed that yet. He just cries. He cries when he's hungry. He cries when he's full. He cries when he's tired. He cries when he wakes up after a long nap. Basically, any day that ends in Y, Chauncey cries. There also seems to be a connection between his volume control and the gas pedal of the SUV. The louder he howls, the faster Step Monster drives. Who's a happy baby? She coos over her shoulder into the back seat where the rear-facing car seat is anchored. Who's a happy big boy? Not Chauncey, that's for sure. I tell her, hey, school zone, you better slow down. She speeds up. Motion is soothing to a baby. Well, maybe so, but as we salome up the driveway, swerving around parked parents dropping off their kids and screech to a halt by the entrance, it turns out to be one motion too many. Chauncey throws up his breakfast. Suddenly, there's cereal on the ceiling and dripping down the windows. That's another thing about Chauncey. His stomach is a food expander. It goes in a teaspoon and comes out five gallons. Get out of the car, Step Monster orders frantically. You have to come in with me, I protest. They won't let me register without an adult. She looks frazzled, and I guess I don't blame her. That much baby puke must be hard to face. I'll run home, change him, and wipe down the cart. Wait for me. Ten minutes. Fifteen at most. I mean, what can I do? I haul my backpack out of the SUV and she zooms off around the circular drive. I don't even have a chance to make my usual Parmesan cheese joke. That's what it smells like when Chauncey barfs. When I first came to California to stay with my dad and Step Monster, I thought they ate a lot of Italian food. That was a disappointment. One of many. So there I am in front of Greenwich Middle School watching swarms of kids arriving for the first day of classes. A few of them glance in my direction, but not many. New girl, who cares? Actually, the new girl doesn't much care either. I'm a short timer. I'm only in Greenwich for a couple of months while mom is off in Utah shooting a movie. She's not a star or anything like that, but this could be her big break. After years of paying bills with bit parts and sitcoms and TV commercials, she finally landed an independent film. Well, no way I could go with her for eight weeks. Not that I was invited. Eventually, a bell rings and crowd melts into the school. No step monster. I'm officially late, which isn't the best way to start my career at Greenwich. But short timers don't stress over things like that. Long before it, could come back to haunt me on a report card, I'll be ancient history. I check on my phone. It's been 20 minutes since. 10 minutes, 15 at the most. That's SST, Step Monster Standard Time. I try calling, but she doesn't pick up. Maybe that means she's on her way and will be here any second. But lots of seconds tick by. No barfing crusted SUV. With a sight, I... With a sigh, I sit down by myself on the bench at the student drop-off and prop my backpack up on the armrest beside me. Step Monster. Her real name is Louise. It isn't all that monstrous when you think about it. And she's way less out of touch than Dad, which might be because she's closer to my age than his. She isn't exactly thrilled with the idea of having an 8th grader dropped in her lap right when she's getting used to being, getting the hang of being a new mom. She's trying to be nice to me. She just isn't succeeding. Like when she strands me in front of a strange school when she's supposed to be here to get me registered. The roar of an engine jolts me back to myself. For a second, I think it must be her. But no, a rusty old pickup truck comes sailing up the roadway going much faster than even Step Monster would dare. It reaches the bend in the circular drive, the front tire climbs the curb, and the pickup is coming right at me. Acting on instinct alone, I hurl myself over the back of the bench and out of the way. 
The truck misses the bench by about a centimeter. The side mirror knocks off my book bag off the armrest, sending it airborne. The contents, binders, papers, pencil case, gym shorts, sneakers, lunch are scattered to the floor winds raining down on the pavement. The pickup screeches to a halt. The driver jumps out and starts rushing after my fluttering stuff. As he runs, papers fly out of his shirt pocket and he's chasing his own things. Not just mine. I join the hunt. And that's when I first get my look at get my first look at the guy. He's a kid, like around my age. Why are you driving? I gasp, still in shock from a near miss. I have a license, he replies, like it's the most normal thing in the world. No way, I shoot back. You're no older than I am. I'm 14. He digs around his front pocket and pulls out a laminated card. It's got a picture of his stupid face over the name Parker Elias. At the top, it says provisional license. Provisional? I ask. I'm allowed to drive for the family business, he explains. Which is what? A funeral parlor? You almost killed me. Our farm, he replies. I take produce to the market. Plus, I take my grams to the senior center. She's super old and doesn't drive anymore. I've never met a farmer before. There aren't a lot of them in LA. I knew Greenwich was kind of in the boonies, but I never expected to be going to school with old McDonald. He hands me my book bag with my stuff crammed in every which way. There's a gaping hole where the mirror blasted through the vinyl. I'm running late, he stammers. Sorry about the backpack. He jumps in the pickup, wheels it into a parking space, and races into the building, studiously avoiding my glare. <sighs> Still no sign of Step Monster on the horizon. I call again, straight to voicemail. I decided to tackle the school on my own. Maybe I can get a head start filling out forms or something. The office is a madhouse. It's packed with kids who, A, lost their schedules, B, don't understand their schedules, or C, are trying to get their schedules changed. When I tell the harassed secretary that I'm waiting for my parent and or guardian so I can register, she just points me to a chair and ignores me. Even though I have nothing against Greenwich Middle School, I decide to hate it. Who can blame me? It's mostly Chauncey's fault, but let's not forget Parker McFarmer and his provisional license. My phone pings. A text from Stepmonster. Taking Chauncey to the pediatrician. Do your best without me. We'll get there ASAP. The secretary comes out from behind the counter and stands before me frowning. We don't use our phones in school. You'll have to turn that off and leave it in your locker. I don't have a locker, I tell her. I just moved here. I have no idea where I'm supposed to be. She plucks a, play a paper from the sheaf sticking out of the hole in my book bag. It's right here on your schedule. Schedule? Where would I get a schedule? I don't even officially go to school here yet. You're supposed to be in room 117. She rattles off a complicated series of directions. Now off you go. And off I go. I'm so frazzled that I'm halfway down the main hall before I glance at the paper that's supposed to be a schedule. It's a schedule, all right. Just not mine. At the top, it says, Elias Parker, grade eight. This is Parker McFarmer's schedule. It must have gotten mixed up with my papers when we were gathering up all my stuff. I take three steps back in the direction of the office and freeze. I don't want to face that secretary again. There's no way she's going to register me without Step Monster. And if there's a backlog at the pediatrician's, I'm going to be sitting in that dumb chair all day. No thanks. I weigh my options. It's only a 15-minute walk home. But home isn't really home. And I don't want to be there any more than I want to be here. If I went to all the trouble of waking up and getting ready for school, then school is where I might as well be. My eyes return to Parker's schedule. Room 117. Okay. It's not my class, but it's a class. And really, who cares? It's not like I'm going to learn anything in the next two months. At least, nothing I can't pick up when I get back to civilization. I'm a pretty good student. 
And when Set Monster finally gets here, they can page me and send me right to the right place. Not that I'll learn anything there either. I've already learned one lesson Greenwich Middle School has to teach me. 14-year-olds shouldn't drive. That's when I learned lesson number two. This place is a maze. My school in LA is all outdoors. You step out of class and you're in glorious sunshine. You know where you're going next because you can see it across the quad. And the numbers make sense. Here, 109 is next to 111. But the room next to that is labeled storage closet E61B2. <laughs> Go figure. I ask a couple of kids who actually try to tell me that there's no such room as 117. There has to be, I tell the second guy. I'm in it. I show him the schedule, careful to cover the name with my thumb. Wait, his brow furrows. What's? He points to the class description. SCS 8. I blink. Instead of a normal schedule where you go to a different class every period, this says Parker stays in room 17 all day. Not only that, but under subject, it repeats the code SCS 8 for every hour except lunch at 12.08. Oh, here it is. I skip to the bottom where there's a key explaining what the codes mean. SCS 8, self-contained special 8th grade class. He stares at me. The unteachables. Unteachables? I echo. He reddens. You know, like the untouchables, only, uh, babbling now. These kids aren't untouchable. They're, well, unteachable. Bye. He rushes off down the hall. And I just know. I could read it in his face. But I didn't even need that much information. Where would you stick a guy who could alienate a backpack with a half tongue pickup truck? The unteachables are the dummy class. We have a couple of groups like that, that in middle school in California, too. We call them the Disoriented Express, but it's the same thing. Probably every school has that. I almost marched back to the office to complain when I remember I've got nothing to complain about because nobody put me in the unteachables, just Parker. From what I've seen, he's in the right place. I picture myself sitting in the office all day, waiting for Step Monster to arrive. If she arrives. Chauncey's health scares, which happen roughly every eight minutes, stress her out to the point where she can't focus on anything. To quote Dad, geez, Louise. He really says that. An example of the sense of humor of the non-California branch of my family. So I go to room seven, 117. Turns out it's in the far corner of the school, over by the metal shop, the home and careers room, in the custodian's office. You have to walk past the gym and the whole hallway smells like old sweats, old sweat socks mixed with a faint barbecue scent. It's only temporary, I remind myself. And since my whole time at Greenwich is temporary anyway, it's more like temporary squared. Besides dummy class, disoriented express, unteachables, so what? Okay, maybe they're not academic superstars, but they're just kids, no different from anybody else. Even Parker. He's a menace to society behind the wheel of that truck, but besides that, he's a normal eighth grader, like the rest of us. Seriously, how unteachable can these unteachables be? I push open the door and walk to room 117. A plum of smoke is pouring out of the single open window. It's coming from the fire roaring in the wastebasket in the center of the room. A handful of kids are gathered around it, tossing marshmallows skewered to the end of number two pencils. Parker is one of them. His own marshmallow blackened like a charcoal bricket. An annoyed voice barks. Hey, shut the door. You want to set off the smoke detector in the hall? Oh my God. I'm with the unteachables.